In other words, my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Last week, you'll remember, it was all about ants. I said how you could take a queen, a soldier and a worker and examine them under a magnifying glass. But you wouldn't really learn anything about ant behaviour until you let them make a nest. Letting them develop a structure allows them to become a force of nature, something wonderful and formidable, almost a single organism in its own right. And I said that humans can do something similar if they come together, say, as a cricket team, or like a thousand members of the Women's Institute singing Jerusalem in the cathedral. Emergent behaviour, that's what it's called, emergent behaviour. Characteristics that develop when enough come together so that they can begin to function as one. I said, I finished by saying that, that, that a Christian community becomes as organised as an ant's nest. And that's how it needs to be if it's going to fulfil its function. And I asked, what is its function? And I said, that will be the question for next week. And here we are. Well, let's go back to ants. What's the function of an ant's nest? And if you listen to Richard Dawkins, England's most famous professional atheist, he'll talk to you about the selfish gene. The selfish gene. Any living creature risks its life and its health to bring its offspring into the world. And it does that not to help itself, and certainly not to help its species, but simply to ensure that its genes will go on. Ants, like human beings, ants and humans are simply machines for replicating other and better ants and humans. Well, not everything Richard Dawkins says is rubbish. He had an Oxford education after all, but there's more to it than that. Apparently there are no fewer than 10,000 trillion ants on the earth. 10,000 trillion ants on the earth, most of them working for Amazon, and their combined body mass far outweighs the body mass of the human population of the world. Ants are tremendously useful. They turn the earth over and help to irrigate it, as well as bringing leaves and other things down into it to make it more fertile. And they control or kill other creatures that would eat crops that humans and other animals rely on. We need ants. The world needs ants. You can't just take a species in isolation. Creatures are interdependent. Ants earn their niche in the ecosystem by catering to each other's needs and the needs of other animals. And ants. Some ants go so far as to bring other insects down into their nests for the kind of milk they need and they pay these other insects by letting them eat their own young ants. That's how evolution works. So, how about humans? Doubtless the selfish gene theory applies to us as well. Humans are very efficient machines for producing other humans, there's no doubt about that. But what about any further, deeper purpose? Well, that's a question that's been asked, of course, ever since humans started talking to each other, and no one's yet agreed an answer. You certainly can't answer it through science, but you can come at it through other ways. You can begin, for instance, by asking what are humans most definitely not for? What is the purpose that we must avoid fulfilling? Last week we had a reading from the prophet Isaiah. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. 
as I heard that being read, I was thinking how we're soon likely to be sending a manned space mission to Mars. Why would we want to do that? Because it's there, I suppose. Because we can do it. Because we're curious. We want to see what's there. We like pushing the boundaries. All that, no doubt. But eventually, perhaps, the idea might be that we'd send colonies out into space to begin to populate the rest of the universe. Is that just science fiction? Well, for the moment, yes, of course, but it may be that it'll come to that. And as I was thinking that, I had a vision of a spaceship setting off with a crew of would-be colonists, bravely heading off into the unknown in a century or so's time, and looking down at the world, and perhaps seeing it brown and dying, worn out like a garment. Humans dying like gnats, colonists having to leave it because the earth has been left with no future. Leaving not for exploration, but to try and find somewhere else where the human race would be able to survive. That's a topic that's a fear to address at another time in another sermon, but it's, as to be said, it's a very real nightmare. It's our function to make sure that this beautiful earth doesn't come to any harm through our own neglect or some catastrophic intervention that we might make or simply failure of goodwill on humankind towards each other or our planet. That's our negative purpose, as it were. That's what it's our job to avoid the world coming to that plight. But we can be more positive than that. We need to go back to St. Matthew's Gospel. Last week's passage ended with a cliffhanger. Who do you say I am? said Jesus. The Messiah came back the answer, and immediately Jesus told them to shut up. He didn't want this spread around. And this is something you find in the Gospels all the time. If someone's healed, if some miracle is performed, if someone has an insight about Jesus, immediately they're sworn to secrecy. And that is the name that has been given to it. It's been called the Messianic Secret. People write books about it. Some people even read them. Jesus wanted his intentions kept quiet. The Messianic Secret. And this week we're given an answer to the messianic secret and why it happened. The old prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah had promised people that things would come right. They just had to go back behaving righteously, obey God, honour the king or the priests, continue their sacrifices in the temple, and the land would recover its prosperity. Well, it didn't work. It didn't work for 700 years after Isaiah or so failed. Then along came John the Baptist with much the same message, repent and be saved. Behave like true Israelites, remember the stone from which you were hewn, that was a concept we had last week, we'll recover our sovereignty if we do that, we'll become God's holy people once more. Did that work for Jeremiah? Well, in the Old Testament passage we heard this morning, we, sorry, I, I should have asked, did that work for John the Baptist? We're going on to say, in, in the Old Testament passage this morning, we heard that it didn't work for Jeremiah. We heard this morning how miserable his failure made him, and it wouldn't work for John the Baptist either. He lost his head. Jesus came along and followed on where John had left off. John explicitly said that Jesus would be the follower. John was the forerunner. And Jesus did follow on John's message, but made it clear that it was going to be different. Unlike with John, it wasn't just a matter of doing what you should. It wasn't just a matter of behavior, following orders, eating the right kind of food, observing the commandments, saluting the flag. It had to go right down to the very core of existence. 
Jesus made it very clear from the start that quite literally it was a matter of life and death. Jesus said that he had to suffer and die and rise again. He told his disciples this, we had this last week, and he called Peter, Peter Satan the tempter, called him Satan when Peter tried to persuade him to take an easier path. And he did this, he did this as we know, he tells us many times in the Gospels, he did this so that the scripture might be fulfilled, that the scripture might be fulfilled. It's a golden thread that runs through the whole of the Bible. It's right through the book of Genesis. Think of Abraham and Isaac. Right through the book of Genesis, that is a theme of the one who has to die to take on the burden that was rightly the due of others. But there's an awful lot more to Scripture. There's an awful lot more to the Bible than just prophecies about a suffering and vindicated Messiah. Right from the beginning in Genesis, it's concerned with space and time, life and death, consciousness, nothingness and eternity, the purpose and scale of the universe, the relation of human beings to the land and to everything, what the future of things is, where they came from, what is the place of human beings in the universe, why is there suffering? All these really big questions that humanity's asked from the start and continues to ask these are all there in scripture and they're not there for us to take an occasional look at and feel good about having looked at the bible for a while they're not there for people to take exams in this is to do what, with what humans are the universe is huge and complex it follows rules that challenge our understanding and yet although it's so big and so much of it so distant. We resound with it. We're part of it. Its physics, its chemistry, its energy and its beauty. This is something not only we have a stake in it, not it's more than that, not only do we have a stake in it, but we're conscious of having a stake in it. We know that we're part of it. We can see that we resound with it and it resounds in us. We're active participants in the workings of the cosmos. This marks us off from other animals and the rest of creation. It gives human beings a privileged position. Well, I said we talk about the function and the purpose of human beings. We've done so and we've come some way, but we're not there yet, not by a long chalk. Next week, same time, same place.